making sure not to touch the zoom here. Great Medieval Battles, old SPI quad. Um, they all use the same core system. Let's hope we don't get a close up of my shirt fibers. Maybe I should go check again. Just because this camera is so tricky, uh, sometimes it sneaks in a bump. So, what do you have? First of all, you have the beautiful box. Um, all the games use the same system. The system's very interesting. Um, mainly, uh, first of all, it's, it uses the interplay uh, simultaneous fire. Uh, not the same system as Nay versus Wellington, one that actually accomplishes simultaneous fire so you can't really game it, but it does make it a little bit trickier uh, to play out. Secondly, it uh, represents combat losses as morale hits, uh, which is perfectly reasonable. It's very much what Great Battles of History does in the, in the long run. Casualties matter, and they aren't really tracked in any of these systems that do this, that I'm aware of. Um, I mean, historically, they matter. They don't matter in these games, and that's one of the problems with it. But, so there's no equivalent to a permanent morale loss in this, except for unit disintegration. Now, the reason that that kind of makes sense is in most cases, units disintegrate well above where the numbers are really starting to make sense now. If you start looking in firepower era, that starts to change. Certainly, like, you know, you look at Civil War units that stayed standing in the line at, you know, 80% or 60% losses or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Iron Brigade just got wiped out, basically. Um, and they're not able to project the same firepower uh, at that point. But if you're looking at something like this, where the frontage is what matters in terms of the amount of damage you can do, actual losses may not be that important. Although the weight of a pike unit or, or spear unit or whatever you've got is gonna be a problem. So it's not entirely an unreasonable uh, thing to abstract away the actual casualties. And you'll see this a lot more in the ancient games than you see in uh, in firepower uh, and linear era, especially uh, based um, tactical stuff. Now you also will see this in some operational games where units, you know, just get degraded a little bit. Um, one example of that is going to be uh, Central Front series, if you ever see it. And that, and that I think was my first game that I recall seeing this kind of. Uh, this kind of degradation from hits, but a little different from this one, closer to the GBOH series. Uh, each of the four games that's included in this has significant differences. Um, in terms of balance, I'm not, I'm not sure about the King Arthur. Uh, I found that one, the major flaw that I had for that one was too much die rolling because of the hand-to-hand -hand combat rolls. Uh, for the next two, Robert at Bannockburn and the Black Prince, they both felt unbalanced, uh, not in the wrong direction. Bannockburn was in the wrong direction. I misspoke when at the end of Tamerlane, which I misspelled, of course. Uh, the Black Prince was uh, unbalanced in the correct direction, but it was so obviously unbalanced. I didn't have to count points in either of those. I didn't have to count points in King Arthur either, but I don't necessarily feel that that was a huge scenario on balance. I made an error with Arthur on the first turn, so it's hard for me to speak to that. Tamerlane seems the closest in terms of balance of the games. And I remember when I played the two games, Black Prince and Tamerlane, I remember thinking, wow, Black Prince was the one I really wanted to play. Uh, 
but I was kind of disappointed in it. And Tamburlaine, I was like, well, it's medieval era, more or less. Let's try it. And being fairly happy with that. I was hoping that the rest of the scenarios uh, would be pretty good. Um, but each of the others has a problem. In a sense, this makes sense. Uh, which, because um, the system designer is also the designer of the tambourine scenario. Whereas the other scenarios are all, of course, written by other people. So let's see, Black Prince, I'm curious who we have notes for. Black Prince, it's uh, Robert Mosca. I've seen his name before, but, you know, he, he doesn't really stick in my head. I, I... Ah, yes. So, uh, Worden is, I believe, the system designer. But he's not given credits on this one, so I'm not sure. Uh, the standard rules... Yeah, Worden's given credits on the standard rules. So, I think Black Prince was completely another person. Uh, Worden does both design and development for the Tamberlane. And you get the feeling that, you know, this was his baby for the series and he probably drafted other people to do other medieval battles using the same system. And they weren't, Mosca did the King and Arthur as well. And that might be a problem having somebody trying to balance out and work two scenarios. And this one is Buccini. Uh, strangely, the playtesters. So, Worden playtested King Arthur. He didn't playtest uh, Bannockburn. And he didn't playtest. Uh, he didn't playtest the Black Prince, which is interesting because the two that are most unbalanced, he wasn't involved in the playtesting. Uh, <coughs> One of the things that people, so this is a system that follows a slightly different uh, sequence of play from most tactical games you're going to look at. It has a, um, it's, it's got an I go, you go type uh, spirit to it in essence, but you have sort of a simultaneous route and rally phase, which all works out okay because usually you only get one of those chances to actually rally units, but it's possible that you might get disrupted at a point that allows you to rally on the off turn as well. But usually you can't move, well, you're not allowed to move in order to get into a rally. But if you lose your rally segment, you don't have to wait a whole turn. You might recover half a turn later, which is kind of cool. Um, and it means both people's units are routing at the same time. So they're moving significantly faster in some cases when they're running away. And that's kind of a nice mechanism which maybe doesn't make sense in some circumstances, but it usually kind of does. A full route is much easier to speed away than, uh, than, of course, a formed unit trying to move over the ground. But here's the problem. Um, by the time you're in that kind of full route, you probably can't recover. Now, the game has that as a... Uh, it takes into account one idea of that, which is that your route level can only go up to level four. But for cavalry, that means that they can move twice as fast as a formed unit on the route. And to me, um, and as a matter of fact, uh, for slower infantry, you can move twice as fast. And fast cavalry can move twice as fast. But for faster infantry and slower cav, six speed units, you're only moving about 150%, which, yeah, that's probably about the limit of what you'd gain by being in an uninformed route. Um, and 
I feel like, you know, maybe those numbers just don't quite uh, work together quite how they should. Um, but basically what you have is you take degradation hits to your formation capability and those will cause you to flee, uh, to fall back or to all out kind of uh, head for the hills. Um, if they get high enough, your unit cohesion is completely gone and you're just destroyed, or if you run off the map, you're considered destroyed. But uh, it, it, that seems like an okay system. I mean, it doesn't mesh perfectly, but no game system really is going to and still be at all playable, I think. Some people have complained about the way the cav charges work. So there's a, an advantage to hit someone when, you, when your cavalry charges. Uh, the combat tables in the game are basically a set, and they're different for each scenario, which, you know, you combine this with the strength points of the units and such and and you really have this sort of... The game becomes more of a template, kind of like... Uh, using the old, hey, use a CRT uh, with retreats and eliminated on it and, ha and exchanges. And, you know, from there, that's your combat system. Now you can play with the numbers and you can shift what the odds columns are and everything. It's got that degree of difference between the scenarios. Um, but each one basically has two combat tables. Fire combat results table, which compares the weapon type, the range, and the uh, armor type of the enemy. And those can be fairly distinguished. And then even more uh, uh, variability is entered into the melee chart, where they list a number of different attacking units versus a number of different defending units, and the range that you need to hit. And then you have modifiers. Well, the modifier for charge is standard throughout the whole series, so everything else has to kind of work around that. A lot of times you'd think, hey, a scenario, you might tweak the mods. Nah, here they just change the base combat table. Um, it has the same concept, but it's a different table for each one. Uh, that means in order to get it right, a lot of work and effort would have to be put into place, and you get the feeling that was not necessarily the case in Bannockburn, especially given that it seems to make sense for the Scots to remain mounted for the whole game. And one of the reasons that it's good to be, remain mounted is you get the charge. The charge gives you a bonus to hit. Once you hit, you still have, the, the enemy has to make a morale check, and their morale check is usually more or less the same. It's just based on their base morale. There are some modifiers, though, to that, and charging cav on their first charge, when they have a lance thing, and that's only for male calf and male and plate calf, um, get a bonus towards disrupting the enemy, routing them more quickly, whatever you want to call it. Uh, some of the other things also give a bonus, so like Shiltrons being shot at uh, by archers because they can't really get at the archers quickly enough or whatever, and they're too densely packed. That gives, you know, a penalty to the Shiltron on, on morale. And just a bunch of different things like that. Archers in one scenario get a penalty on their morale uh, when they're attacked in melee. It's a whole bunch of these little special special cases, and they're fairly easy to remember our scenario in a given scenario. And playing them all one after the other, I could see where they got jumbled together or could get jumbled together. I don't think that happened to me much. I just played all four of them straight through. Um, but anyway, back to the charges. So what you can do is if you can run three spaces straight forward, you get you can take this charge bonus for a cav unit. And that gives it a bonus to hit the enemy. If the enemy is well armored though, well, if the enemy has some good morale, which well armored units tend to have, but they're not exclusively to that, uh, there's a lower chance of causing any hits to them. So it's not like having those charges uh, is a, a huge advantage. Now what it does allow though, is you just have to make your last three moves basically across flatter 
rising terrain um, and uh, that's clear and you strike the enemy which means some of the faster units can be in contact with the enemy run away turn around and charge again well the length of time for a turn um, is about 20 minutes that's quite possible in a 20 minute period to uh, you know the the idea isn't that you're locked in melee after that it's that it's these pass by charges that are basically happening um, some of the slower calf the heavier stuff can't do that at all the lighter stuff yeah you know they charge they make impact with the front line and they either cut right through maybe which doesn't get shown in the game at all or they slice off you know a, a side of it and if they can break away um, then they can come back for another round uh, it feels a little weird in some ways when you try to explain it 20 minutes does seem a little short for that um, it seems almost like a maneuver like a carousel you know <laughs> which obviously it's not what it is um, and in fact with the bow troops with the uh, horsebowmen who you'd think would do something like that they don't do that they generally ride up stop and park in a place and just shoot which feels a little funny too however as an abstraction i think it works okay it doesn't have that huge effect on uh, on the um, uh, play of the game uh, if you have channels that you can run back through that are clear, that you don't have packed in troops, etc., you're able to keep launching these charges. The advantage of the charges, it's not that huge. Um, it really isn't. It's basically your, your force coming back, regrouping, and launching another attack. Uh, doing that once every 20 minutes seems a little odd, though. Uh, I don't know if that's for Tamerlane, which maybe is not the. It looks like the 10 minutes on King Arthur, which is getting to the ludicrous, and 15 minutes for Bannockburn per turn. The scale is a little different in the different uh, Before I knew that it was 20 minute turns, I'm here thinking, you know, maybe they're like an hour each or some indeterminate length. Uh, but there's 10 turns for the battle. Three, four hour battles. Yeah, uh, some of them went on longer than that, so I don't know. But uh, I certainly was of the impression that they were somewhat longer turns given uh, the fatigue ratings and everything. Uh, what else can I say about it? Uh, there's nothing like zones of control in it, which means if you have holes in your line, which you usually will, and the enemy has fast skirmisher-type troops, which might probably are cavalry, they can kind of slip through your line and slip around behind your units, which gives a morale penalty to your unit. It doesn't do a whole lot more, although melee units can attack out their ass. Uh, there's a number of little things in here that are different from other systems that I've seen. Overall, I'm not unhappy with the general system. I just feel like uh, the two scenarios that I had really unbalanced, you know, that I feel are unbalanced, probably didn't get enough development work. And the design decision on the King Arthur to focus so much on the melee combat and there's this little hidden pick thing and everything. Uh, it's tedious. And you could say, well, dude, you're playing in solitaire. You know, that would be so much more exciting. Maybe, but it, it, I've played games where you're making those kind of picks. It's almost just a random selection, to tell you the truth. And uh, I don't get a lot out of playing out this little, okay, I'm going to aim at his head. Worse than that, the little chart that gives you the bonuses for which one you're swinging at or whatever doesn't seem intuitive at all. So, like, in some cases where your shield goes, basically you pick a sword and a shield for this one, where your shield goes is 
appears to be where you're defending the strongest. And in other cases, it seems like it's where you're defending the weakest. <laughs> so like if your shield's placed in helmet or feet, uh, or helm or feet, you end up being harder to hit in those areas. If it's placed to left or right, you end up easier to hit in those areas. And that just doesn't work for me somehow. It's also not symmetrical um, in the sense that like, and that makes sense, but it doesn't make sense with the numbers they've chosen. So for example, defense with a shield to your left is, assuming you're right-handed, is probably easier than trying to defend your right arm with it. And I think that's what they were trying to capture with it, but they kind of flubbed it. Um, the numbers are probably reversed on the chart. Uh, and if that's the kind of thing that really bothers you, you should probably make your own little chart without much uh, difference. In terms of components, for most of the games, there wasn't much problem. However, for the Black Prince, there were a couple of crossbow units that the English have that look like longbow units to me. I think there's a misprint, you know, or there just isn't enough distinguishment between the two bows or whatever. For the, uh, and these are the two battles that I played before, and also the ones that I'm most interested in. For the Tamerlane scenario, there's a color issue. And maybe if the light's brighter, because I'm over here and it doesn't look as bad when I'm right on it, um, it was hard to distinguish infantry from cavalry, which is a big deal in that scenario. Now let's make sure. Uh, yeah, Simonson did graphic design on that one, which is very strange. Usually he nails it down and, you know, maybe the game designer said, no, I really want this color scheme. Look, it's okay, you know, and pointed it out on the lighter, whatever. But I find that Simonson usually doesn't allow those kind of errors. Uh, and by this point, 79, uh, I get the feeling that if he put his foot down about something, it would not get produced without <laughs> the changes that he wanted uh, in terms of graphic design. He made very few errors in graphic design, and uh, mo most of this is, you know, attractive and usable at the same time. It's just, I find the color choices there, especially the blue-green, because blue-green, uh, is very susceptible to color blindness. I, hey, I'm aware of this one because I'm kind of affected by it. I sometimes have trouble distinguishing them. But um, you really need to play that scenario under really good light. My lighting here is not at all bad. I've got like four floodlights above me and then some lights back there. And I was having trouble seeing it. Now, obviously, I'm getting older and everything. But uh, overall, I'm happy to have gotten this and. It's something I've wanted for a while, and I was willing to put some cash in, down on getting a box version of it. Um, it gives an interesting perspective, and the system, I think, is good enough. The problem is, I feel like the individual scenarios, except for the Tamberlane one, all need some kind of work on them to really please me. And in particular, the other two historical scenarios, the balance issue, that can be fixed pretty easily. You just put a bidding situation. The King Arthur scenario, I'm just going to look at that as kind of a loss because the amount of die rolling and the amount of, you know, this stupid little picking, even a, a playing a pose, it would just annoy me, you know? <laughs> uh, it, one of the problems with the man-to-man -man is if the guys are closely rated, there's a good chance that they go through many, many rounds of, of rolling dice against each other without much effect at all. And uh, that's kind of unfortunate. But uh, yeah, this is, this is a, an interesting look at things. Um, I certainly like uh, Great Battles of History more. Men of Iron has some weird things going with it. So this game has a very simple command facet to it, which is the commanders are only there to uh, 
halt, uh, to make units go back into combat, basically. Um, but you can see that as, okay, these units are unwilling to, like, budge. They're, they're hard to motivate, whatever, at certain times. So what you have to do is you have to send the commanders there to strip off all their route points. And then they stop shifting away from the enemy, and you're in control of them again. Uh, again, it's not precisely what you're doing out of command control, but on the other hand, Men of Iron kind of has this, yeah, you got to have a leader, and he has to activate the units and send them forward, and, you know. Uh, and given that both games, you know, you have command over what your your uh, activations are essentially. It doesn't feel, you know, it, it's not like a, a musket and pike or a CWB type situation or Hastings, um, another game that I did very recently, where you can't kind of control your troops or hashing court to a really horrible uh, <laughs> case of that where like you basically have no control over your at all. Uh, instead, in this, you do have control over your units. One nice thing about it, and I have to say, all, almost all the games that I've covered at the tactical level have this nice feature to them. They don't feel chess like to me, right? Uh, this one comes a little closer, but it, it's one of the problems I have with like Ancient Battles uh, Deluxe. Is this, there's so few pieces on the board, and I'm trying to position them perfectly so that I, I get the attacks with the most bonus and cut off things. You've got a little bit of that going on here, but it's not like the whole battle is focused on like, that space is the important one. I'm trying to bring to bear all this stuff. I just feel like I'm playing chess in that case. In this one, what you're doing, those are just sort of opportunity actions where you know you're trying to use the geometry of the situation on a small scale, not looking at the whole board and, and trying to optimize the geometry for a whole board. Um, and I, I see that as a big difference. You know, uh, If a game's so small and geometry is so important that, well, whether or not the game's so small, if the geometry is so important that that's what I'm focusing on primarily for my tactical decisions. I stop feeling like I'm playing a simulation at all, and I start feeling like I'm playing chess instead, and therefore I'm not playing a war game in my view. This felt like a war game, you know? I mean, uh, there's enough randomness in there. There's not hugely bonus positions for the most part. Uh, Bannockburn was a little different because of... Uh, there, there were two sort of I trump you things. The Shiltron trumped the, mount, the, the plate armored, uh, the mounted knights. And the longbow trumped the Shiltron. And, you know, when you've got a situation like that, uh, where, like, mounted troops can cancel out the longbow, more or less, and I don't know, the longbow's already canceling out the Shiltron. It, it just starts becoming too simplistic. Yes, there's, uh, for the English, a flood of crappy infantry on the board, but they basically can't win anything, so they're just garbage. Uh, the Tamerlane, you had troops that were hard, that because of the combat table for that particular game, troops couldn't really affect each other much anyway, so there's a lot of luck on as to whether or not you're able to get a hit at all. Um, but the overall attrition on the armies ended up sending them both into positions where you couldn't really dominate the field with either one. You know, you didn't have all of your forces in play at any time, really, after the battle started, which that's why that one kind of pleased me the most. Black Prince was similar, but, you know, the, Spain, the Castilian forces are just so overmatched uh, that there was really no hope at all for them. Um, Bannockburn, do I feel like the Scots were overmatched? I don't know. Maybe a more clever player 
could win that game with the Scots. Uh, it didn't look hopeless the way uh, Navarrete did, but it did not. It, it, it certainly felt like, and this was a case I had with another recent game, the uh, Nine Years, uh, the War of the Grand Alliance. It felt like if it was not unbalanced, you had to be a significantly better player. Yeah, there, there was a, a very high bar for one of the sides. It doesn't necessarily mean you know two high class players uh, might have a fair game, but if you had a couple of not so good players, <laughs> one of the sides has a significant disadvantage. Yeah, that's the case in a number of games, but uh, anyway, in, in, in terms of Bannockburn, I could see, uh, I, I, I could definitely see where the Scots have some shot, because at least they have the Shultrons that kick butt. Um, other things, though, like I could see no historical, re I could see no game reason to do the historical uh, action of dismounting my Scottish knights and strengthening the line with them. They, just the way the combat tables are aligned or designed, um, sounds similar, right? There was a, uh, there's just sort of a, yeah, um, I'd rather have that bonus of the charging calf um, available because once you dismount them, they never remount. Anyway, uh, you know, this is not a fantastic set of four battles. But it's pretty cool, and uh, it gives you ideas of other ways to handle things that other people haven't handled. Hey, I do have spies here. Huh. Might end up getting done soon anyway. Somebody requested it. We'll see what my spirit is on that. It's so sad. <laughs> All right, let's end this out. Uh, assuming it recorded, and assuming... Oh, shit.